Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. I'm your host Isaac Nellis and I'm speaking to you from unceded Gadigal Wangal land. This week I'm again joined by refugee rights activist Chloe and we'll be taking you through the latest activist news from Australia and around the world. Hi Isaac, I'm speaking from Wurundjeri Woiwurrung land and if listeners haven't heard of Green Left, it is a people-powered media project that has been running for more than 30 years. We centre the voices of activists and provide a, an alternative to the corporate news media. You can become a supporter today for only $5 a month at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. Before we begin, we acknowledge that this podcast is recorded on stolen land that has never been ceded and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Bosses in the farming, mining, construction and petroleum industries are campaigning against a federal plan that would force them to pay labour hire workers doing the same job, the same pay. The Australian Council of Trade Unions estimates that more than half a million people are employed through labour hire and earn almost $5,000 less a year than other workers. Businesses use current labour hire laws to undercut wages and deny workers paid leave. Labour says it plans to introduce these important reforms later this year, which is being supported by the Mining and Energy Union and the Meat Workers Union, as well as the ACTU. The other aspect is Pacific migrant workers who will also get the same job, same pay rules, so they are paid in line with locals. Sarah Hathaway, who is tipped to become the newest member of the City of Greater Geelong for Windermere Ward, believes the northern suburbs residents are about to be let down again. The Victorian Electoral Commission, the VEC recount, following the resignation of Councillor Kylie Griesbeck at the end of May will not be held until the day after the councils draft a budget on June 27th. The draft includes millions of dollars worth of cuts to many services, including libraries and the loss of at least 19 jobs. Hathaway told Green Left that the combat could and should be held before June 27th, and she said they have a vested interest in their budget passing and likely don't want another person on council who is going to vote against it. Hathaway, who is a Karaya resident, knows the cuts will impact those who are most disadvantaged, and Karaya was ranked third most disadvantaged in the state. Sarah is organising a community meeting to oppose the budget cuts at Labuam Square in Norlane on June 20th at 5.30pm at the newly opened Lab Square Commons space. A union community rally and march against the cuts is also being organised by the Australian Services Union and Geelong Trades Hall Council on June 24th at 10am outside the Geelong West Library. The incredibly inspiring occupation of the public housing estate at 82 Wentworth Park Road, Glebe in Sydney by Action for Public Housing activists and others has come to an end. Activists suspended the occupation after five solid days, which saw solidarity and support from unions, community groups, local councillors and housing campaigners. They said they would return to defend the building from demolition. A significant win was getting Housing Minister Rose Jackson to promise on Twitter that the site would remain public housing instead of social or affordable housing. But Action for Public Housing organiser Rachel Evans told Green Left that the housing minister must protect this site and guarantee it will remain 100% public homes in more than just a tweet. Campaigners have proposed an alternative plan that involves building more housing at the back of the estate without demolishing any existing housing, as well as immediately filling the empty apartments with people from the 50,000 long New South Wales public housing waiting list. The campaign was strongly supported by the Anti-Poverty Centre and the Sydney Uni SRC. Meanwhile, in Nam, even as the demolition is underway, a housing protest was held on the steps of Victorian Parliament to protest the demolition of Barack Beacon Housing Estate in Port Melbourne. Long-term resident Margaret Kelly led the protest, telling the crowd that they had even demolished the, children, the children's playground. Kelly is still living in the estate, even as parts of it get knocked down. One protester told Green Left they want to stop the privatisation of public housing. More rallies are being held every Thursday at 12 noon. And some new research has found that about half of all bird species are in significant decline, with 3 billion fewer birds in North America and 600 million fewer in Europe than a few decades ago. Research published in May found that the major factor driving the decline in bird populations 
was actually intensive industrial farming. In the most extensive study of bird population dynamics to date, more than 50 ornithologists, zoologists, biologists, and ecologists analyzed data for 170 bird species in more than 20,000 sites. The chemicals used in farming were the biggest killer of bird populations, either directly through ingesting the chemicals or indirectly by killing off food sources such as insects and also by eliminating nesting and shelter areas. Other factors included the loss of habitat from urban growth uh, and deforestation and climate change. Now let's hear what is happening around the world. A new study has found that rich countries owe 192 trillion US dollars in climate reparations to global South countries in exchange for their excess carbon dioxide emissions. The Nature Sustainability Study analyzed 168 countries and quantified how much each had gone beyond their fair share of the global carbon budget, estimated by the IPCC requirements to keep global heating below 1.5 degrees. Rich countries, including the US, Australia, Canada, Europe, New Zealand, Japan and Israel hold responsibility for 91% of the overshoot of the planetary carbon budget from 1960 to 2019. The US alone has pumped four times more than its fair share of carbon into the air and Australia is already at 3.5 times. One of the guests at the upcoming Eco-Socialism 2023 conference in Nam, veteran Pakistani socialist and global climate justice activist Farooq Tariq, told Green Left that climate justice demands that the global south no longer be held hostage by the environmental sins of the rich. He said it's time for wealthy nations to acknowledge their debt to the third world and pay their dues in the form of climate reparations. This will be one of the key discussions and themes of the conference, and you can get your tickets now at ecosocialism.org.au. Another one of the exciting guests at the conference will be Christian Mark Paul, an activist in the Singapore climate movement. He spoke to Green Left about the climate politics in the country. He explained that almost half of Singapore's emissions come from its oil industry and that a lot of the country's wealth comes from the extractive industries. He said Singapore is responsible for negative impacts on its neighbours, including over-importing sand. However, he is cautiously optimistic because younger generations want action and opposition parties are gaining seats in parliament. And the United States has raised its debt ceiling, which is the amount of money that the government can borrow. There's actually a lot of media hype in the US about the threat of the country defaulting on its payments, but it was actually a false crisis because both major parties would always come to an agreement to prevent a default. However, as part of the deal, there are some big losses for working people, while big businesses win big. The fossil fuel industry won approval for the Mountain Valley Pipeline as part of the deal, which activists have been fighting against that proposal for more than a decade, and now the pipeline will be pushed through without proper environmental reviews, and the project will disproportionately impact the poor, elderly and indigenous communities. The defence budget was also raised, and now if you include military spending by other departments, it's at more than a trillion dollars a year. Meanwhile, non-defence spending on social needs has been restricted to a 1% rise, which is effectively a budget cut. Another big loser is students, after the Biden administration ended the freeze on student loan payments implemented during the pandemic. Past cuts to tax for the rich, which caused the debt crisis in the first place, have been preserved, and the Internal Revenue Service, which was supposed to fight tax evasion, has been weakened. In short, Biden and the Democrats, with the support of the Republicans, have used the so-called debt crisis to make things worse for working people and better for the ruling class. In Colombia, thousands took to the street to support the Gustavo Petro government's labour, pension and healthcare reforms. The mobilisation was called by unions 
and comes in the context of a destabilisation campaign against the government by right-wing politicians and mainstream media. The proposed reforms were a cornerstone of the historic pact coalition election campaign in 2022, with demands from social movements for expanded access to healthcare, education, jobs and pensions escalating in the 2021 uprising where hundreds of thousands marched against neoliberal policies. Progressive forces have emphasised the need to stay on the streets, this time to defend the government and its policies from right-wing attacks. On the same day, more than 400 political and trade union leaders signed a progressive international letter condemning the soft coup attempt against Petro. And the Communist Party of Swaziland, or the CPS, is launching its Break the Chains campaign to demand the release of political prisoners, including its central committee member, Muzalelo Cabela, who was arrested in February along with another CPS member, Bongi Mamba, for organising a demonstration and blockading a road agitating for a boycott of the upcoming undemocratic elections in August. Swaziland's King Mswati III is Africa's last absolute monarch, and only candidates selected by him are allowed to run in the elections, which the CPS describe as a farce designed to legitimise the monarchy. All political parties are banned, and the legislative body has no power to hold the monarchy accountable. The Break the Chains campaign will start with protests in smaller towns and rural communities, both to free political prisoners and oppose the sham elections. A devastating train crash in India where around 300 people died and a 1,000 were injured was caused by the neglect of railways and poor maintenance caused by the privatisation and profit-seeking by the Modi government, according to the CPIML Liberation. The collision of two trains on June 2nd in Balasore district is one of the country's worst rail disasters in years. There are many devastating stories of people searching for their loved ones amidst the destruction. The Modi government has increasingly marketed the railway system as a transport system for the comfort of the affluent instead of a safe, affordable and people-friendly mode of transport for the masses of Indian people. Eco-Socialism 2023, A World Beyond Capitalism, is coming up on the weekend of July 1st and 2nd in Nam or Melbourne at Victorian Trades Hall. Activists from across the Asia-Pacific region will discuss how to campaign for and win an eco-socialist future. But why do we need an eco-socialist future? Here are five big reasons. First, because capitalism will continue to expand production endlessly, trying to maximise its profits. This spells climate catastrophe, more species extinction, pollution of atmosphere, land and sea. Second, because even capitalism running on renewable energy means more people are forced to do precarious bullshit jobs that destroy the environment, deepen inequality and worsen quality of life and mental health. Third, because despite rapid technological change and increased productivity, under capitalism, work hours did not decline during the 20th and 21st centuries. An eco-socialist society can deliver a shorter work week and make the content of the work we do more fulfilling. Fourth, decarbonisation simply cannot be accomplished fast enough to stay under 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees global warming if high-income nations continue to grow at around 3% per year. Only a system that is no longer based on the race and competition for profits will deliver a slower economy. And finally, because only by liberating the majority from the depotism of capital can we gain the freedom to make choices about what we produce collectively and how we do it. Eco-Socialism 2023 is open to anyone who wants to learn about progressive ideas and be part of the fight for a better world. Find out more information on panels and speakers and get your tickets at ecosocialism.org.au. Green Left needs your support to continue. You can become a supporter for only $5 a month and donate to our 2023 fighting fund to help us make more content like this. Go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. And remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Listener.